thank you everybody for joining today. My name is Meg Diaz, so I head up the uh, product marketing team at Cisco um, for our cloud security organization. And today, our webcast series, this is the, the latest edition in our series, which is called Threat, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And this is a regular series that we do that gives you a deeper view um, of, of things from the Cisco security research team, so some of the research that we're seeing, some of the major threats that we're, that we're coming across. And we also have a customer always join us to give a bit of their perspective as well. So today, I'm really excited to have Steve McLean from, the, um, from Ortho Clinical Diagnostics here with us today from the customer side. And then we have ArtCM as well, one of our security researchers at Cisco. Um, so we're gonna start off, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna start off uh, having a bit of a, a talk with Steve about some of the things that um, he's, how he's been using the Cisco umbrella and investigate product. And then ArtCM is then gonna go into a bit more detail on crypto mining and cryptocurrency. Um, and he and Steve will, will have a bit of a, a back and forth on that. Um, what I'd encourage you to do is, is throughout the webcast, feel free to submit any questions in the Q&A panel, and we will hopefully have some time at the end to cover those. But like I said, feel free to, to uh, submit those throughout. So with that, um, Steve, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Um, and I wanted to see if you could, you could give us first a, a quick overview of how orthoclinical diagnostics is uh, what, what you guys do there, what your role is, and why security is so important for your industry. So I'm the senior manager at Orthoclinical Diagnostics. Been an a open DNS customer for about 14 months now and looked to get open DNS in because I needed some immediate visibility and um, the ability to protect our endpoints when we're off network and such. Um, so we're a medical device company. We make blood, blood diagnostic equipment. So like with many medical device companies or any company, you're always concerned about protecting your customers' data, your employees' data. We're a global company. We have 50% of our workforce is mobile. So we don't need on-premise firewalls. We, well, we do, but we don't need them as much as we need to protect every endpoint everywhere in the world that we exist. And OpenDNS is one of those layers that definitely helps us do that. Great. And what prompted you initially to start looking at Umbrella in the first place? When I, when I first came to the company, because we used to be part of Johnson & Johnson and divested, so we're, we're an old company that's acting like a startup. We had to rebuild everything from our data centers, our HR systems, everything. So as part of that, when I joined, there was very limited tools and logging and things to give me visibility into protecting our endpoints. So our 3,000 plus PCs that are off of our network I had no visibility into those, what was happening, except when they would connect via the VPN, and then I would see all the bad activity occurring. So that's where I did some research, and I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm an old time um, open DNS user. I use the free stuff at home. I've been using it for about eight years. So I definitely went towards open DNS as my immediate solution to give me visibility and protection on all of our endpoints. So that's, sorry, I didn't evaluate anybody else. I just picked the product I knew that worked fantastic at my home and had been wanting to get it into the corporation. So I went Great. with it. Yeah, and that was, that, that was a, the, I had mentioned that when you were rejoining that OpenDNS is still our, our home uh, offering and then Cisco Umbrella is the is more the enterprise security product. So in case you hear those Correct. terms, they're you know the, the same on the yep. enterprise side. Um, and Steve, when you look at um, over the the past year and a half or so that you've had Umbrella, what what would you say is the overall value that you that you've seen? I immense value. Um, when we came into the company, there was. A lot of malware going on. Um, the proof of concept, which was really production, you know, we, we switched over our DNS servers and 
allowed Cisco OpenDNS to gather a lot of information. And it was alarming as to how much was going on. But our endpoint security wasn't finding it. Our next-gen firewalls weren't finding it. Um, so OpenDNS found it, and I spent the first four months tracking down all of the, the bad activity that was going on, uh, directing tickets to the teams to fix servers and or endpoints, et cetera, and then also closing the holes, you know, um, some personal, not personal, but, you know, the, the private block list or the block list I can create myself for the company, and then fine-tuning the selection of categories to block, which advertising is, or the, the ad networks, those are, seem to be a, a lot of what drove some of the, uh, the malware that we were receiving. So blocking those ad networks improved the performance of PCs because they weren't loading ads, the, the site still worked, and definitely cut down on the malware. And if you were to estimate, how much would you say you've been able to reduce malware across your environment? Uh, I would I would put it sixty plus percent. Great, and then you it's, also it's, so you've been using oh go ahead. No, oh, I was just going to say it's it's sixty plus percent easily. Um, and actually, we had a with with the the agent that you can load on endpoints, which provides significantly more protection. So it's not just where you think it's open DNS and all it's protecting is DNS. When you have the endpoint agent loaded, it also inspects, it can inspect IP address and HTTPS traffic. So it, it took a couple months of testing and gaining the confidence of desk site support and the server team for me to turn on IP inspection and HTTPS inspection. But once I turned that on, that bumped it up another 20% of malware that was occurring behind the scenes that we weren't detecting elsewhere just from DNS. I found botnet activity going directly to IP addresses that nothing detected out there. Um, so that's where it's it's gone up and down, you know, but is a solid 60 plus percent easy the agent is their open DNS has helped especially with the agent great and then you also use investigate which for anybody who's not familiar with it it gives you access to all of the threat intelligence behind umbrella either through a console or an API so Steve, can you tell us a bit uh, how you use investigate for threat hunting certainly so when I when I when I got my cloud account to log into the dashboard for OpenDNS, I found Investigate. I didn't know I was even getting it, and once uh, I started looking into it and using it, I just thought this is a fantastic goldmine of of information. You know, from a from a threat research, a threat hunting, you name it. It's I I use it daily. You know, we have. Um, as many companies, we get lots of phishing emails. A lot of them are caught, and a lot of them actually make it through. Um, our folks are pretty well educated on looking for the indicators, the red flags for phishing emails. So I get 35, 45 phishing emails forwarded to me in the security email box. And I look at those. I grab the site um, out of those pop them into OpenDNS, and look at the information around that, look at, um, you can pivot off of the domain registration, the email address, see if there's potentially other bad sites that might want to be blocked, or I might want to look into that, if this one's out here, did anybody go to this other one? And then go to the activity report and see if anybody in the company has clicked on the link. And if it has, I can find their machine name, contact them and ask them if they actually entered their credentials and then block it for the rest of the company. And I, I frequently tell my um, customers, you know, our, our employees at the company that I've, in essence, deputized some of them. They're, they're my security eyes and ears in the rest of the world. And, I you know, I stress to them how their human intelligence finds things that technology can't. That's why 
I always encourage them to keep forwarding these phishing emails to me because it protects the rest of the company. They're helping the greater good of the company be protected. So I can put those into OpenDNS and a custom block list. Most of the time they're already blocked by OpenDNS, but sometimes maybe we're the first occurrence of it. I put it in there. Then I also um, submit a ticket to let the OpenDNS team know to look into this and they usually get back really quick and then block the site, which protects everybody else on OpenDNS. And it might be helpful to actually share an example. Um, are you, would you be able to, to share um, a, a recent investigation that you've done? I can pass you over control. And yeah, then we can actually definitely. show live what, what Investigate looks like. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's quite, quite the fun tool. Um, Okay, just pass that over to you. All righty. Let's see, let me pick one here that I just got. And let me share my screen. Always good to do that. Pick the right screen, here we go. I've got multi-screen, so I was trying to make sure I get the right screen. Okay, so th this is the actual Investigate console here and one of the one of the phishing sites i just got the email this morning this is this is the domain and when we look at it the first thing that's always an indicator of a phishing site this is fantastic here the history of of like the past week or so you can see there's almost no activity a little blip there now there's a big spike and this history is not my company's history. It is. It could be comprised of my company's history, but it's it's all of OpenDNS. So when you think about the hundreds of millions of DNS requests that OpenDNS processes daily, and how many customers are using it, whether it's free uh, people using the free service or the enterprise service, they had 98 queries on May 1st. You know, and it kind of died off. There was another little spike there. So that's a definite indicator of something happened. Either it's a command and control or it's part of a phishing network campaign, et cetera. That's, that's always a, a huge plus to look at that. It's usually interesting to look based on other information from the registration, the email address, how many domains are associated with that email address, and OpenDNS allows you to pivot into that and look at other DNS names that are registered, pizza 241, 241, you know, probably not legitimate, something you might want to block. And it could already be blocked. A lot of sites, even if they may not show up here classified as being blocked, the IP addresses can be blocked, then they block domains associated with that. So, so as part of this, I can easily look at this and say that it's, it's suspicious. I can look that the DNS requests have predominantly come from Serbia and Mongolia. Um, definitely nobody should be going there. It was classified as a phishing site actually on May 3rd. I don't know if you can see this text, it's a little small, but it says phishing, um, phishing blocked. So it was already classified as a phishing site and blocked. And I just got it this morning. So it's huge benefit of investigate and if you're a data geek like I am there's so much information in investigate you can just you could spend days going through here and doing extracts and finding things that you want to block um, that are not blocked you know but you, maybe you want to personally block them based on the type of category or content that's associated with it Excellent. Um, and so now that now that everybody has a little bit of background on, on Investigate, you can see some of the intelligence behind it. Um, Steve, if you want to pass the control over to me, we could we could maybe go um, transition over to Artium, and um, maybe you could give a, a bit more of a, a background on the threat intelligence and, and the the team here at at Cisco. Oh yeah, for sure. And there we go. Uh, just can share the slides. 
But basically, I joined the uh, OpenDNS team about three years ago uh, before we got acquired by Cisco. Uh, my main job is a threat analyst, so I'm, uh, I have access to uh, most of the um, darknet forums trying to get all the relevant data. We uh, keep looking at all of mm -hmm. the new threats popping up there for sale. And uh, we try to build our uh, threat intelligence uh, having that in mind. But I think our biggest advantage is, uh, as Steven already mentioned, global DNS reach. So right now we're probably uh, running about 3% of all of the DNS traffic in the world. If you think it's not too much, uh, Google does only about 5%. So we are, uh, you know, almost as good as they are, even so their reach is much more than, uh, you know, we can do at this point. Uh, so we uh, have about 100 billion requests a day, and uh, we um, incorporate all of the uh, threat intelligence data that's coming from other uh, Cisco um, uh, sources, such as AMP threat points, uh, Talos uh, also um, sharing data with us, and we're sharing data with him such as enriching our, you know, threat landscape coverage. Uh, our uh, uh, research team uh, actually working on applying statistical uh, models to the DNS traffic because you can, you know, review uh, internet as a lot of nodes connected together. So a lot of graph theory actually works when we apply it to the DNS traffic and patterns. Uh, analyst team, as I already said, we focus on the threats that are out there where all of that includes, you know, pivoting through our global data, uh, dissecting malware on parts, trying to see uh, if there are any hard-coded credentials, if we can find any exposed infrastructure, and, of course, the open source intelligence. So we collect open source intelligence, but we also, you know, give it back. And uh, can we get to the next slide? So right now, uh, some uh, statistical models that we have in the production that uh, work every day in producing uh, malicious domains to block, uh, secure rank, uh, which maps all the identities based on the DNS request, and it was presented two years ago as the Black Hat USA. So you can uh, always find uh, most of these classifiers and uh, talks about one hour uh, goes into you know all of the details. I will just uh, cover them uh, you know really quick. NLP rank, it's our phishing protection. It leverages natural language processing to identify phishing instances. And then we take as a analysts all of that data. And once again, we go back and we see if we can pivot more data of that. DNS tunneling, uh, our DNS exfiltration protection. Uh, some uh, of the rats and trojans uh, uh, leveraging this type of the techniques to exfiltrate data. So I think it's very important to cover that. And we, as a DNS provider, can do it very efficient. Uh, EK scanner hit list discovers domains which involved in the ex exploit kit campaigns, once again, leveraging our global reach and all of the lenders so we can get all of the gates that we don't discover yet. But some of the people who went through the gate and landed on the exploit kit domain that we convinced before, we can go back and see who sent them to this uh, exploit kit domain and block it. Auto who is uh, something that we've uh, talked with Steven uh, before. Uh, it is a predictive threat discovery that based on the malicious registrant. Right now we convince most of them manually, but we have a data model behind that produces all of these uh, registrants. Uh, we try to avoid uh, highly abused registrants, sinkholes and other stuff. And we also keep in mind that uh, GDPR law is coming pretty soon in Europe, and uh, we don't really know what it will mean for the global quiz data, but definitely European data, like we will lose it. So as a security researcher, I'm very upset with that, and we will see what we have to come up with to you know, tackle bad guys. And the mail runner is, uh, presumably goes for the mail spam, as uh, uh, Steven mentioned, a lot of uh, malware, a lot of phishing comes through the uh, mail still, and it has a pretty good uh, turn rate. Uh, so we try to cover that as much as possible. Okay, next. 
All right, uh, co-occurrences is one of the models that we were able to develop uh, as a, a DNS provider. So if, uh, you know, any other company uh, having uh, lots of data, they don't, they can't really do uh, this type of the things. Because what it, what's happened is that we look at uh, all of the DNS traffic at the global scale, and then we apply our statistical model to already block domains uh, with an intention that um, how your domain most likely will be malicious. And uh, if you interested in the actual uh, actual functions behind it, if uh, uh, Mac can pass me the presentation ball, I can just quickly share it with you. Yep, just passing it over now. Okay. All right, so as you can see, uh, the functions behind it are not super crazy, but what, what we've been able to do is that we can take all of the client IPs that uh, connected to the specific domain within specific time frame summarize them, take all of the clients in the world who have anything to do with that domain, normalize the query, and then have a C-rank, uh, that's how, or crank, as we called it, with a specific uh, threshold. So when you go into the investigate, and you go down to the co-occurrences, uh, this um, number is actual our uh, co-occurrence rank. So the closet, uh, to 100, which means that most of the time that specific domain is requested with uh, another domain, it means that they very, very tied together. So if we take an example, uh, Monero hash, which one of the uh, Monero mining pools, we can pretty easily identify other pools just looking at the co-occurrences and you know, not doing any other uh, thread discovery work on that. And Artkin, so that, that can also help with showing, you know, what domains are tied together as part of an attack, or maybe you have a legitimate site that was compromised and is now being used as part of an attack. So that's, that's really what co-occurrences can show you, right? This is correct. Also, it shows you the sequence of uh, actions. So you uh, requested one, one domain, and if that domain contains some type of the malicious redirect, it will immediately redirect you to another domain, and that's what we're able to see with a co-occurrence model. Okay. Now let's get back to our slides. How do I stop presenting? There we go. Um. Yeah, I'm giving it back to you, May. Perfect. Uh, do we want to uh, jump into the crypto mining right away, or Stephen, do you want to share uh, how you come up with you know this type of the issue and how you try to solve it before we? I uh, got the crypto mining category. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we can we could do that. I could share my screen again. I was, I was going to actually show you um, some activity that's occurring on our network right now with crypto mining. Yeah. Do you want to, Arkin? Do you want to go through the, yeah, the crypto just mining just to make sure it. everybody has? Yeah. Because yeah, exactly. once you talk about the the category, let's let's go through that just to give a little bit of background <laughs> for everybody. So uh, most of the people probably now familiar with cryptocurrency uh, a couple years ago probably wasn't as well known in the world, but we have you know good reasons for that. And less than one year, we saw that the crypto market cap went through the roof. Uh, Bitcoin craziness, you know, bring all sorts of uh, uh, malicious guys into the pool. Uh, the cryptocurrency market is going mainstream, but as we all know, it's not in any way regulated by any government identities. There are very limited amount of laws around it. So we know everybody wants to be rich, and a lot of people jump on that uh, cryptocurrency streak. Can we get to the next one? And if the people who are 
willing to get the cryptocurrency and use them, uh, they can uh, do process that we call as cryptocurrency mining. So uh, what it is is just the process of generating more currency units. Uh, it's uh, regulated by the encryption techniques used. Probably most famous cryptocurrency is Bitcoin, and it's still uh, the um, mainstream. Uh, even uh, we see about uh, you know hundreds of new uh, alternative coins coming out. They all tie to the Bitcoin. So if the Bitcoin go up, they all go up. If the Bitcoin goes down, they all go down. It also verifies the transfer of funds, and uh, any client can participate. So if you are a cryptocurrency enthusiast and you are using, you know, trying to mine a currency by yourself, you know that not always this process is malicious. And you don't really require that much. You just need to have hardware, computer, server, mining farm. Now there are cloud mining farms that uh, outsource it to any other clients. You have to have some mining software. Mm, usually it's open source since most of the cryptocurrencies are open source. Uh, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, and uh, uh, scripts uh, which come uh, with a um, new coin called Monero. It's highly anonymous coin, and the main uh, website that drove the adaptation of this coin so widely is the Coin Hive. And the uh, third part, the last thing but not the least, is the connection to the blockchain or mining pool. Even so, you will have hardware, software, and uh, uh, try to mine within your uh, environment, you can create some currency, but it wouldn't worth anything until it's incorporated into the global scale. So you have to have a uh, connection to the blockchain or mining pool. Next. Well, so that brings us to the crypto jacking. You probably all heard it uh, get to some uh, top rated website uh, we found the instances on uh, Tesla public cloud. Cryptojacking was uh, embedded into the uh, UK's data watchdog. Uh, AWS instances uh, were mining Monero for someone else. And uh, also uh, big time uh, corporations uh, and their websites got hit with it, such as uh, Showtime and uh, other um, domains that have a lot of users coming to it. Next one. So what's happened is uh, CoinHive gave anyone the ability to use their user base to make money. Uh, if you have a very popular website, you can embed your crypto mining script. Uh, tell your users, hey guys, if you want to support me, just visit my website and let me mine some money using your hardware and software. And from what I've heard, people some people don't mind that. They see it as a good alternative to the ads. However, what's happened with CoinHive is that about 99% of those scripts were not disclosed. They were embedded in the uh, web servers without the owners of the uh, domain knowing that. Uh, so it's uh, pretty illegal. Uh, usually those domains have some kind of flaw. So the threat actor is able to inject that uh, coin hype script onto the website. And when your regular uh, visitors go in there, they start noticing their CPU ramped up and uh, some of the reports saying that uh, you know PCs were unusable and some of these crypto jacking scripts, they don't close. If you leave the page, they will uh, still running in the background, uh, you know, drowning your resources and upsetting end users. So that led us to, you know, investigation uh, this threat and coming out with a crypto mining uh, category, which let you um, protect uh, your environment from all of the pools and most of the uh, domains that we uh, identify with uh, web crypto miners. So uh, even so, uh, you. Uh, let me actually that probably would be good as an example. Can I get the the ball? Yes, let me just hand it over. Okay. Well, so if we look at one of the 
first domains that embedded CoinHive knowingly, it was a Pirate Bay. So right now I opened it and we can check if it still has a crypto mining script in it. And we go to CoinHive. And yes, indeed, the you know CoinHive script is here. So in theory, my computer should uh, start uh, mining money for someone. We can detect it with activity monitor. And where is it? And my CPU power should ramp up dramatically. However, it's not happened. So the reason is I'm on the protected network. And even so, I access the website, a live website that has embedded CoinHive script. Since we're blocking it, the connection to the coin hive isn't happening the connection to the pool isn't happening so i'm safe and to go uh, further and if we want to you know remove any possibility of people going to those domains that would be quite hard because uh, just right now coin hive script is run on 23000 websites just from the first million of alexa rank every day they change every day man and new domains are getting the script uh, domains are getting compromised and we see sometimes you know some days we see decrease of these domains but some days it's getting up to like 50 60 and 100,000 of domains so it's if you want to uh, have your network uh, without any crypto mining to serve your resources your electricity bill uh, just the nerves you probably should have this uh, category enabled for blocking. And Steve, uh, do you, do you want to share an example of what you've been seeing with crypto mining? Yes, sure. I can do that. Cool. So now everybody has a bit of background on, on what we've been able to do on our side with Umbrella. Um, now you can kind of see you a little bit live and, and from a, a customer view. Let's see if I could grab that. There, it goes away. Okay. <clears throat> so this, this is the, the activity search within OpenDNS or Umbrella. And I can see that um, this was yesterday that I had some activity for crypto mining, falls in multiple categories. So this is one other feature that's been extremely beneficial. The even though the, the open DNS agent, you think it's just DNS or it's just doing IP, when it's a, when it's a suspicious domain name, it can actually proxy the traffic through Cisco's cloud proxy and inspect and look at um, JavaScript and other things that are that could be processed. So that's why it says proxied. It was actually proxied through the cloud. And with with these sites, <clears throat> they could have multiple categories like crypto mining and or software technology. So when I look at these, I recognize a lot of these, like NiceHash, I'm familiar with that. That's a site where you can set up and it's, it could have uh, any any type of mining pools associated with NiceHash. Um, I was talk talking with Artsium earlier and he was talking about this site here, this ATI, API Bitfinex, that that's more than likely somebody has something loaded on their PC and they're trying to do crypto trading and stuff. So it's a combination of could be crypto mining, could be online training or online trading. With this, when I look over here, because there are some systems that do not have agents loaded on them, I get that it came from one of our domain controllers. I can track back who it is through the domain controller, but in, in here I can tell which domain controller is coming from, from a DNS query standpoint, and then go after it. And because I started blocking crypto mining um, before Cisco had a category, like I said, I went out, I, I did some research, I found some mining pools, you know, use Google extensively to look for mining pools, scrape that information, and created my own block list. 
and that's where this is, I still have my block list. Uh, so this says, it was, this was blocked, so I blocked CoinHive back in October of last year, and it was on my block list, still is, but now it's also classified by OpenDNS as potentially harmful and crypto mining. And, you know, this, this more than likely means that this person or this PC went to a website that was trying to pull that uh, CoinHive mining script. And I, I think something that's interesting, if you look at Investigate with CoinHive, that we're talking 800 to a million DNS requests a day to CoinHive. That's, oh, I'm sorry, this is actually an hour. Is it's what there? It's per hour. So oh, it's per hour. To a oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Per hour. hour. Jeez, that's even more. Um, it, it's amazing how how many requests are just going to CoinHive um, constantly. So that means there's a lot of crypto jacking going on. There's a lot of people that are mining, and they don't even know it making folks a lot of money. <laughs> and as Bitcoin prices go up, people are more aggressive with pushing crypto mining out there. But anyway, from this, because I know most of this, I have most of this locked down, I'm more interested in sites that are more of, uh, of crypto mining pools versus hitting CoinHive or hitting these API sites and such. And I, I generally don't have many that I find that truly are infected, you know, with uh, crypto mining or crypto jacking. These, like I said, these people visited some site. I may take some time and go back and look at some co-occurrences uh, of what this person was going to and possibly what drove them to CoinHive. I found at times there are ad sites that are not blocked, and I add those ad sites um, trying to think what there was one that was pretty interesting that I blocked it had to do with uh, I can't remember what it was but I used investigate to find it and block that because it was definitely a, a form of malvertising putting crypto jacking on our endpoints Steve, I have a question for you about that. So for your company overall, did you mm -hmm. have to take a stance on this? Um, did you have any employees who wanted to be doing this, or, or did you just decide that you were going to block everything? I'm, I'm pretty aggressive in my blocking just because the, the goal is to protect the company. It's all company equipment. Therefore, it's not for personal fun and use. You know, we can't, uh, we can't use resources of the company um, to potentially make a couple dollars for somebody. So it's, uh, I just took from our information security policies that the equipment's only supposed to be used for the company and blocked it. I haven't had any, anybody complain, you know, whatever's causing this API blocking here, it may be somebody that's interested um, in doing some crypto mining or crypto trading and such. And even then, again, it's, it's corporate equipment, can't be used for that. Um, eventually, if I get some time, I'll probably track them down and send them a note and remind them of the policy of installing software on their endpoints, or look at their look at their activity. You know, what else have they been going to? Um, if they're somebody that's generating a few blocks, it's not a big deal. But if I find somebody that's generating thousands and thousands of blo uh, blocks from various categories and such, then I know that their machine is compromised where this person is doing something nefarious on our network. Because this picks up even our guest, um, people that get on our guest wireless, we pick them up on this, even though they don't have the agent installed, because all of their DNS requests come to OpenDNS, and I can track it back and detect the traffic or, and or block it. Yeah. And, and at what point did you start um, looking at this? Like, I, I'm curious in, in terms of the, the trends that you're seeing in RCM, I'm, I'm curious also from your perspective after, um, you know, at, at what point did you kind of see this uh, come into play and did you start looking at it and have you seen spikes or, or changes in that? I, I started looking at it um, back in October of last year and implemented it 
implemented my own blocking list somewhere around November of last year. And it, you know, it came up when there was some discussion on CoinHive. I started looking into it. That was probably in August of last year, August of 2017, and realized that this is this is so dangerous and so easy. And uh, like RCM said, you use some of these sites to look for websites that have this Java Java script embedded. It, it's exploded and. There's some companies that have produced charts that as the Bitcoin price goes up, the number of CoinHive instances go up as well. Again, when there's more, quote, reward potentially for doing something wrong, people are willing to take that next step and um, become a cyber criminal. All right, Dan, what about from your perspective? What, what have you yes, been seeing? Uh, the first instances of the coin hive start emerging uh, early August. Uh, it, the service positioned itself as a replacement for, you know, disturbing ads, and they promised that all of this malvertising wouldn't happen when you will have just a coin hive. It's just one script, you know, the domain. But what's happened is that they might create it with a good intent, but too many people on the dark side so the high value, especially given that uh, CoinHive is mining Monero. Monero is a very uh, anonymous uh, coin, so it's really hard to track. Uh, if you look at the CoinHive script by itself, you will see that all of the pool is anonymized. So you can't even know who put that script, who those money goes to. So we decided that it's not a good way to do business and uh, the coin hive wasn't uh, you know doing any public announcements how they're gonna stop that abuse uh, what's happened is that they actually went further and they registered more domains that will help people who are blocking uh, coin hive or actually like who will uh, let coin hive script through the networks of the people who blocking specifically coin hive so we decided that uh, we have to come up with uh, something that will let people block uh, this particular threat. Unfortunately, we had a couple customers who were mining or they uh, their website was using CoinHive script and they knew it and it's happened that we were blocking. So we uh, had to develop the entire new category which will give our customers as much granularity as possible. So even so, it would be like, you know, a little small amount of people who really want to mine those currency for themselves. We still decided that, you know, it's, you know, they, they can do that. But for uh, most people, just simply enabling the block on the crypto mining category will block out 99.9% .9 of all the crypto mining we know about right now. Great. And um, I, I just sent a note through the chat, but if, if anybody in the audience has any questions for Steve or RCM, feel free to submit it through the, the Q&A panel. Um, and uh, let's see, Steve, any other comments that you, that you wanna make um, either regarding crypto mining or, or anything else we touched on today? Um, with, with the, the crypto mining, you know, like we were saying, they keep coming up with different techniques. Um, it's more profitable. They've calculated to do crypto mining versus doing ransomware. It's easier to do the crypto mining, crypto jacking, uh, and infect machines. Um, it's, I've only been with Open DNS Enterprise for, like I said, about 14 months, but there has been some big changes in features and capabilities of the product, and it just keeps evolving. Um, I've seen some of the roadmap, and there's some really interesting things coming down the pike really soon, uh, which is gonna be a huge benefit. Um, I, may, I may be some of the driver of that. I've been a very avid uh, person submitting feature requests and or bugs and things like that, so. Um, and they've, you've been fantastic at the response and features and capabilities you've been putting in the product. Awesome, that's good to hear. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we did have we did have one question come through. Um, so, what effect is there for people who may use a proxy anonymizer to access 
say Pirate Bay? Uh, so if someone tried to get to the Pirate Bay using like, uh, like what type of anonymizer? If they have a VPN client or they go through Tor network? So I can tell you what I do in my, my case. There's a category for anonymous proxies. Um, I block those, and I block dynamic DNS. Um, generally, it doesn't cause a problem, blocking dynamic DNS. There's a few instances folks need to get to some things, and we've, we've whitelisted those. But there's uh, another new category that uh, residential, uh, residential IP addresses or residential type blocking, something to that effect. And those have all helped you know, protect, protect the company from people trying to go through those reverse proxies to hide their tracks. Yeah, and there was a clarification that it was the, the VPN anonymizer specifically. Yeah, uh, our product has the capability to identify, you know, VPN instances and block them, but that's mostly driven from the people who are using our product with a network, such as network admins, uh, we, uh, as a company, understand that sometimes VPN is needed, so we are not blocking them by, by default, but we'll give the customer uh, possibility to block such instances in their network. Right. Like in my company, I block VPN as well, but we've whitelisted our VPN and, and a couple other things. So again, that's where what's what is the company using and what should they not be using, right? So block everything and then just whitelist what should be used. Another question, is there a special protection or category for domain generation algorithms, fast flux domains, et cetera? Uh, yes, uh, we have a set of uh, DGA classifiers that go for specific threats. Those are coming from uh, reverse engineered malware. They had the seeds embedded in the code. So uh, most of them are tied to the dates. However, I can recall one that was tied to the Bitcoin price. So before it will generate a new C2, it will check the Bitcoin price and depending on the price, it will generate a new name. And uh, those classifiers are in place and most of the DGA based domain names uh, we are successfully blocking. Uh, fast flux uh, has to do with a uh, uh, giant amount of IP addresses uh, some domains are going through with very short time to live. We're also detecting them. Uh, we have a specific fast flux uh, detector, and uh, we block in as the domains participating in the fast flux activity and the exposed IPs as well, because most of those IPs usually reside on the bulletproof hostings or very questionable ASNs. And for a lot of the, the domains that would be categorized with, you know, as a DGA or, or fast flux, um, that'll actually show up as one of the alerts. Of the, so if you go in and search a domain, it'll show you alerts at the top of the, the screen and will highlight those sorts of um, behaviors and activities. Correct. Looks like that's all the, the questions for right now. Any any final comments from Art, Sam, or Steve? Uh, no, I don't have any. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today, spending the time with us, and a special thanks to Art, Sam, and, and Steve for, for sharing your insights and, and your use of the, the product. So we appreciate it. And uh, just so everybody knows, the recording will be available um, and uh, will be sent out as well afterwards. So thanks again. Hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you.